Hello, friends of St. Peter's. We are so glad you are with us this weekend. It is an exciting weekend. We have our guest preacher, Mark Jefferson, who is one of my dear friends from seminary and is currently the Assistant Dean for Community Engagement and Equity at the Harvard Law School in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So welcome, Dean Jefferson, as our preacher. We are also delighted to share in Harper Grace Slabricorn's baptism. Yes, our first baptism since this pandemic began. And Reverend Martha uh, and the Slabricorn family were able to uh, baptize Harper Grace, and we will have a chance to share in that and celebrate her wonderful baptism as well. Now, in the description of this video, both on YouTube and on Facebook, you will find a link to the bulletin. You'll want to click on that link so that you can sing along, follow along, say your parts, and help us make this worship together. We also hope that you will like and share this video so that your friends and family and maybe college roommate can join us in worship this day as well. As this is also the Sunday when we hear the story of the Transfiguration, our opening hymn will be Christ Upon the Mountain Peak. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. There is one body and one spirit. There is one hope in God's call to us. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord 
be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, who before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the second book of Kings. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you live yourself, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you live your life yourself, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they were both standing by the Jordan. Then Elisha took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry land. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken away. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet... If you see me as I'm being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended to a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join in reading the psalm responsively by whole verse. The Lord, the God of gods, has spoken. He has called the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in its beauty, God reveals himself in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence. Before him there is a consuming flame, and round about him a raging storm. He calls the heavens and the earth from above to witness the judgment of his people. Gather before me, my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. Let the heavens declare the rightness of his cause, for God himself is judge. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. 
even if our gospel is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzlingly white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who are talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Dear friends, it's my favorite time of every weekend when we have a chance to reflect on the scriptures with our youngest friends. And so I invite you to welcome the youngest members of your household around the phone or the laptop, tablet, or perhaps the TV uh, where you might be watching on YouTube. So we have a chance to have some time together. Well, my friends, I know you know that this weekend is Valentine's Day and um, I think it's fine when Valentine's Day falls on a Sunday or a Saturday, when we have a chance to hear God proclaim belovedness and Jesus' belovedness and our belovedness and remind us that we are beloved of God just as Jesus is as well. And that's what we heard in the uh, gospel this morning, we heard that Peter and James and John went up with Jesus up to the top of a high mountain where Jesus prayed. And some really amazing things happened, like Moses and Elijah appeared and, and, and God was seemed to be speaking to the three of them, but those disciples really couldn't hear what they were talking about. But they could hear at the very end when God said, this is my beloved. Listen to him. And then they all had to go back down that mountain again and get back to the work of God. And that's rather what we do here, isn't it? We come together, whether it's in person at St. Peter's, which we miss so much, or if it's here, we come together and we are reminded of how much God loves us so that we can then go back into the world 
to do God's work of love and bringing transforming grace and love and forgiveness into the world with us. Just like uh, the disciples wanted to stay up there and, and we even hear Peter you know, wanting to make that whole moment permanent as if you could somehow cage the wind. Um, uh, we hear that uh, that natural desire to hold on to those moments um, of grace and, and we hear that what's really called of all of us isn't to stay in the church or stay on the top of the mountain, but to go and be God's people in the world and bring God's love in the world. And today, today we get to celebrate the baptism of Harper Grace Slabbercorn. And baptism is all about this. Baptism is all about hearing the words of God's love for us and receiving the Holy Spirit in such a way that we can go out and, and give this love to others. And so I'm glad we can hear this story on a weekend when we're celebrating Valentine's Day, but remember God's love and how God's love poured into us allows us to pour that love into the world. So in the week ahead, as we celebrate Harper Grace, as we give thanks to God for all that God will do through her in her life of faith, we can also celebrate what God can do through us, through our acts of love, through our acts of forgiveness, and those times when um, we, we love one another, even when it's difficult, those times when we receive love from others, we receive God's love, and it helps us do the work we need to do, even, even when it's difficult, even when it's challenging, when there are days when we just want to stay in bed or days when we just uh, want to stay at home. Right now, a lot of us are staying at home when we'd rather be out of the world, but you know what I mean, those times when... Um, when we maybe aren't feeling so brave and courageous, but we still know we need to follow Jesus. And uh, that gift of God's love and God's voice that we hear today, um, that we hear proclaimed again uh, for us and for Harper Grace in our baptism, that gift of love is what we need to bring out into the world so that God's grace, mercy, and love can change the world to be the world God dreams it can be instead of the nightmare it can often be for some people, just as our presiding bishop is often reminding us, we're called to help God's dream come true. So I hope you'll pray with me about what that means for you in your life and what it means for you to let your light shine. It is my great pleasure to welcome to St. Peter's Pulpit, Dean Mark Jefferson. Uh, Mark is a longtime friend of mine uh, from our days back at the Boston University School of Theology and serving together as chaplain associates at Marsh Chapel at Boston University. And the students that get to have uh, Dean Jefferson as their Dean for Community Engagement and Equity at the Harvard Law School are certainly blessed uh, to have his compassionate leadership. And I am delighted for all of you to have a chance to meet Mark. So Mark, welcome to St. Peter's. Greetings to you, St. Peter's Episcopal Church. And thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to join with you and to, and to share the good news. I want also to thank my dear friend, Reverend Paige Blair, who I believe I've known now for some 29 years. Um, 
we attended Boston University together as chaplains in 1992, if I remember correctly. And I, and I can attest that her faith then was as clear and pure and inspiring then. Uh, you could hear it in her voice the first time you met her. It was as clear, uh, inspiring then as it was when I talked with her just a week ago. So I wanna thank St. Peter's for allowing me to be in your company to share a little bit about the good news. And I want to thank my dear friend, the Reverend Paige Blair for inviting me into your company. I wanna take as my topic for the day, the following. To get up on the mountaintop, you've got to get in on the ground floor. To get up on the mountaintop, you've got to get in on the ground floor. And I hasten to beg your forgiveness and to ask for your patience as I move the starting line back just a bit in order, hopefully and prayerfully, to get a running start on the focus of our gospel reading, the transfiguration of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. At the very beginning of Mark's gospel, during the days, weeks, and months prior to Jesus leading Peter, James, and John, up the side of a high mountain, Mark shares with us that these three disciples were the first witnesses to the master's itinerant ministry of teaching and healing. Peter, James, and John, three fishermen, three essential workers were the first disciples that Jesus called to follow him after his baptism by John the baptizer and after his 40 days in the wilderness where our Lord's spirit had been tempted and tested. Perhaps we can still imagine some 2000 years later that bright and anticipatory morning when with the promise of the days catch before them, the freshness of the new day's air encouraging them and the clearness of the lake's waters beckoning them. Peter and his brother Andrew heard the voice that is unlike any other, the voice of the master calling them from a now shrinking distance as he walked along the shoreline of the sea of Galilee towards their fishing boat and drawing ever nearer that voice that is unlike any other asking them to set aside their fishing nets, calling them to follow him and inviting them to become fishers, not of fish, but of all humanity, to become fishers, not of fish, the master said, but of all humanity. Can you imagine it? that brilliant anticipatory promise-filled morning, the fresh morning air, the clear beckoning waters, the rising sun burning off the last mists of the morning dew, the day's events only just beginning to unfold. And here, walking along the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee comes Jesus, calling these two brothers to discipleship. And in that very moment, you can imagine Peter and Andrew knowing that all that they had done before they met Jesus, suddenly mattered little to them compared to knowing all that they could do if they walked with Jesus. And perhaps we can still imagine farther on down the shoreline and later in the day during that last workable hour of the sun's fading light, when Jesus, now accompanied by Peter and his brother Andrew, happened upon another set of brothers, James and John, both feverishly at work in their boat and skillfully repairing their fishing nets before returning home in the dusky and dimming light of a work day come to an end, perhaps to prepare a meal, to repose with their families, to say their nightly prayers all before falling fast asleep, only to awaken the next morning, to return to their fishing boat, moored on that great span of shoreline abutting the Sea of Galilee, setting out again in search of and hope for the day's new catch. Maybe James and John were repairing their nets in a kind of disappointed solemnity, only now aware that their day's work had been for naught upon discovering the hole in their net. Maybe James and John were repairing their nets in a spirit of joy and mirth, having brought in a haul of fish so huge that the catch of the day had torn the seam of the very net that had provided them with so much good fortune. Good fortune enough that maybe the brothers James and John were discussing taking the next day off. Maybe the next two days off. Their bounty had been so great. The gospel writer Mark does not tell us 
what James and John were discussing. We do not know what they were talking about before Jesus showed up. Lost to us is their recounting of that day. But what we do know is that Jesus called them to follow him. And when he called, they set aside their nets, disembarked from their boat, bid farewell to their dear father Zebedee and bid farewell to their hired servants and followed him whose sandals John the baptizer said he was unfit to even untie. Before Peter, James, and John found themselves high atop that nameless mountain that was the place seen and setting of our Lord's transfiguration. They had entered onto the ground floor of the good news movement. They had entered into the ground floor of the good news movement. Before Peter, James, and John found themselves witnessing our Lord's transfiguration, they had signed up on the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee and got in on the ground floor of the good news. But I like that. These three disciples, these three essential workers, these three fishermen, these three witnesses to our Lord and Savior's transfiguration, each one of them has signed up on the shoreline and got in on the ground floor of the good news movement. The master called and they laid down their nets. Jesus called and they followed. They signed up on the shoreline before they climbed to the mountaintop to witness the transfiguration of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And isn't it also something that Jesus has now begun his itinerant ministry of teaching and healing alone? Isn't it something that before he enters the synagogue to teach it, to teach and heal for the first time, he calls disciples to join him? If you want to go fast, an African proverb said, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And if you want to go all the way, Go with Jesus, go with the Lord, get in on the ground floor and go all the way with Jesus. These three disciples were there with Jesus when he entered the synagogue for the first time and taught as one with authority. They were there when, after his first lesson, that nameless, tormented, world-weary soul declared, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And what was afflicting this First man whom Jesus healed, a man whose name we do not know. We call him up, we don't know his name, but what afflicted this man whom Jesus called? Was it some shattering loss of a child or partner, parent or sibling? Was it a reputation ruined for speaking up for what was right when everyone else was skillfully ignoring what was wrong? Was it an inability to find employment and food for his family in the midst of a pandemic, was it that his children had been taken from him and caged before him while he was deported back to the very land he was fleeing for a better life here in this land? Or was it the slow dimming of hope that befalls a life no longer able to grasp its own meaning until one feels surrounded by an inalterable and unshakable darkness that tormented him? to the point of breaking and beyond. Whatever was the cause for the affliction in this man's life, he found Jesus and Jesus healed him. Whatever the cause of the afflictions in our own lives, if we find Jesus, Jesus will heal us. The gospel writer Mark does not tell us what afflicted this nameless man, but he does tell us that Jesus healed him. And he tells us that Peter, James, and John were there. They were witnesses there at the very first teaching and healing of this marvelous, world-transforming itinerant ministry. They were there when our Lord took some of his first steps towards Gethsemane, and they were there when he took his final step towards Calvary. They witnessed him transforming lives before they witnessed him transfigured. I want to repeat that. They witnessed Jesus teaching and healing and transforming lives before they witnessed him transfigured. And these three followers, these three essential workers were also there later that day when Jesus cured Peter's mother-in-law of fever. And they were there, Mark present, when at sundown, all the city was now gathered 
at Peter's doorstep and Jesus healed one by one and one must imagine late into the night, the broken bodies and wounded spirits of all who came to be healed all in one day, all in one day, all in the same day. What is this new teaching? I was a fisherman. Who is he who commands the unclean spirits and they obey him? Now I'm a disciple all in one day. He who called me has a calling that calls the whole world unto him. And in one marvelous and miraculous day, he called me and I became his disciple. Can you imagine what Peter, James, and John must have thought at the end of that very first day? Can you imagine what they must have felt? Here I was preparing my nets in pursuit of the day's catch of fish. And here I was mending my nets at day's end. And all along this crowded shoreline, fishermen everywhere, many of them my friends, boats everywhere, many boats I've worked on, nets everywhere, ready to bring in the day's haul. And Jesus called me all in one day, all these fishermen. And Jesus picked me out all in one day. The master called me and I follow him. Before they were atop a high mountain, with Jesus in the moment of his transfiguration. They signed up on the shoreline before they were atop a high mountain. They got in on the ground floor. But how does one get in on the ground floor of the good news movement in order to get up on the top of the mountain and to witness the moment of transfiguration? I wanna suggest there are three things that we can do. Number one, when Jesus calls, you follow. Number one, Jesus calls. You follow. It's amazing to me, and perhaps you will also find it amazing that all throughout Mark's gospel, a gospel filled with one journey after another, one trip away from the crowds to find rest on the Sea of Galilee after another, one town visited after another, one synagogue taught in after another, one home visited to perform another healing after another, that the disciples never asked Jesus. A simple question, where are we going? Say Jesus, say master, where are we going? But they don't ask, isn't that amazing? In fact, the gospel record reveals to us that the first time he called, they followed. They did not ask where Jesus was taking them. They did not ask what they were going to do. They did not ask for his credentials. It is as if they knew as well they should have known that walking with Jesus was enough for them. They didn't care where they were going. They didn't care because wherever they were going, they were going with Jesus. There is no record of them asking Jesus what he did for a living. There is no mention of Peter, James, or John asking him what schools he attended, attended who his folks were, where he was born. Jesus called. They followed. They didn't ask how much money he was going to pay them to follow him. They didn't ask him how he knew how to become fishers of humanity. He simply called, they simply follow. And how many times has Jesus walked towards us and we walked away from him? How many times have we known of someone in need and turned other way? Whatsoever you do for the least of these, you do also for me. I know there is the homeless woman. There's a homeless woman I passed all the time. I don't know her name. I pass her all the time. I'm on the way to work. I don't know her name, but sometimes I give her money. Can I check back with you tomorrow, Jesus? I really have to have to get back to work. And on the weekends, I'm I'm too tired to volunteer. I work all week long. And on the weekends, I'm I'm too tired to volunteer. Can I get back in touch with you tomorrow? Can we make an appointment to work through what you mean by fishers of humanity? I mean, I can help, you know, I can help here and there, but there's only so much one person can do. And besides, you know, besides, I have some important deadlines to meet. It is as if they knew, it is as if they knew as well they should have known that walking with Jesus was enough for them. They didn't care where they were going because wherever they were going, wherever they were going, they were going with Jesus. They were going with the master. When Jesus calls, you follow. That's number one. That's the first thing we can learn from these three disciples, these three essential workers for Jesus. If you want to get in on the ground floor 
of the Good News Movement. Sign up on the show line. Don't worry about the nets and bolts. Don't worry about how much this is going to cost and who's going to pay. Don't worry about when we'll be done and when we can get back. Number one, when Jesus calls, when he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit calls, you follow. That's number one of how to get in on the ground floor to get up to the mountaintop. That's number one. Number two, when you follow Jesus, you won't need to make any prearrangements and you won't need to carry much. In other words, number two, when you follow Jesus, pack light. Number two, when you follow Jesus, pack light. You would think, you would think at least one disciple would have asked Jesus about what they might need to pack. And you would think that one of them, Peter, James, or John would have asked for just a few days, just a few days to set their affairs in order. You would think that at least one disciple would have inquired about stopping by their home to put together an overnight bag or or placing an ad in the local newspaper to sell their nets and boats or, or making a few visits to relatives and friends to tell them about the good news movement and how they had signed up to travel with the master. And you would think that they would have packed just a few things before setting off Jesus. Master, I don't wanna be a nuisance. And I know you said that we're going to be fishers of humanity, but what I don't know is what I will need to bring along. I know about boats. And I know about tackle. I know about bait. And I know about wading boots. I know about tides, inward moving and outward. Moving. Master, could you tell us? I don't want to be a nuisance, but could you tell us what we need to bring to go out into the world and become fishers of all humanity? There's got to be some kind of special materials we need. Must be some critical equipment we need to bring along. There must be some special garments we need to to wear and to pack away some special nets we need to cast. Maybe there are some promotional materials, you know, we can send in advance. We'll need to print them up. We can send them in advance and bring along and distribute, distribute along the way and in advance, let the folk know what we are doing. But they didn't ask. I find that remarkable. I find it amazing. I find it instructive. When you follow Jesus, this gospel seems to be saying to us, pack light, ask another way, apply to our own walks of discipleship. What's holding us down and what's holding us back? What are we carrying that keeps us from following him? What keeps us from ministering to those in need all around us? What keeps us from spreading the good news about the good news movement? Ask another way, what are those hurts that we need to heal? in our own lives? What burdens do we need to lay down? Our world, this world, our world is filled as it is with more information than we can process. It is, we have to admit, confusing one. It's a confusing world to navigate in the best of times. Our world, stricken as it is by a worldwide pandemic of deadly disease, stricken by the worldwide pandemics of racism and sexism and heterosexism and ableism and classism is difficult to navigate, Lord, in the best of times. How in your holy name are we to pack in the worst of times? Jesus, when we don't know, what we don't know is what to pack or to leave behind to follow you in the best of times. How will we know what to pack and leave behind to follow you in times like these? Master, what do we need to leave behind in order to sign up on the shoreline and to get in on the ground floor so that we can arrive at that glorious mountaintop to witness you and witness about you in all your majesty and all your glory? There must be something we need to pack. You would imagine one of these three essential workers for Jesus would have asked, but the gospel of Mark is silent on this question. I believe because to walk with Jesus, which is to say, to take up this itinerant ministry of teaching and healing. Those in need of teaching and healing is all that you need. Pack light and follow him. Pack light and follow Jesus. Come as you are and the Lord can use what you have to do the work the Lord needs us to get done. You don't need to make prearrangements. You don't need a special pair of shoes or a particular set of clothes. You don't need to find 
a more convenient time or a more opportune time because when the master calls, when the master calls, when Jesus calls, time is always right. Jesus is right on time and the time is always right. When Jesus calls, come as you are. Number two, when you travel with Jesus, pack light. Number one is when Jesus calls, you follow. Number two is when you follow him, pack light. Sign up on the shoreline and lay your burdens down and pack light. All you need to do is show up and God will provide the rest. That's number two. Number three is, and when you arrive, look and see. Number three is, when you arrive, look and see. And then one day, after days and weeks and months of traveling with him, he led them up a high mountain. I imagine that day began like the many days before with a, with a whispered prayer of thank you for making it through the night, maybe a few words of thanking God for being blessed to greet and live in another day. Perhaps then a bit of washing up and dressing, perhaps a little bit of breakfast, we can see them, Peter, James, and John, readying themselves for another day of traveling with the master while he taught and healed. But that day, that day, the Gospel of Mark tells us that that day, Jesus led them up a high mountain. It is a marvelous thing when you follow Jesus in pack light. It's an amazing thing that when we take on discipleship and follow him, who even the winds obey, even when you think you know what the day will bring, we actually never quite know. We never actually know what the day will bring. We don't know who will be in need, but someone will be in need. And we don't know who needs to hear an affirming word, but someone needs to hear an affirming word. And we don't know whose hand needs to be held, but someone needs a hand to hold. It's a marvelous thing that when you follow him and pack light, that you will never know how the day will unfold. It's a miraculous thing that when you walk with him in his itinerant ministry of teaching and healing, that we will find ourselves being transfigured and transformed every step along the way. But this morning, he led Peter, James, and John up a high mountain, that nameless mountain that was the place and scene and setting of the transfiguration of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Gospel writer Mark tells us that high up on that mountain, Peter, James, and John heard the voice of God. But I suspect the Gospel writer Mark is also telling us that on the shoreline, when they gave themselves to Jesus, he was the beloved son right then and right there, and that they had heard, even if they didn't know it, they had heard, even if they don't know it, even if they didn't know it, God's voice there too. It seems to me that so much of what is so good about the good news movement is that we never know when or where, and we never know what or how, but if when we arrive, as we move about the world from task to task, we take a moment to listen and see. We hear God's words giving meaning and guidance to our own lives, and we will see the gloriousness of his ministry at work in our day-to-day -day living. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. When Jesus called, follow. When you follow him, pack light. When you arrive, listen and see. This is my beloved son, whose body was broken and whose blood was shed to redeem our lives and the lives of all humanity. Listen to him. May God bless you all. Amen. As I mentioned in our welcome this morning, we are blessed to be able to celebrate the baptism of Harper Grace Slabricorn. So delighted and our thanks to Reverend Martha for returning to baptize Harper Grace. Please do follow along in the bulletin so you can say all the responses and participate in Harper Grace's baptism from home. The candidate for holy baptism is now presented. We present Harper Grace to receive the sacrament of baptism. Will you be responsible for seeing that the child you present is brought up in the Christian faith and life? We will with God's help. 
Do you renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? I renounce them. Do you renounce the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? I renounce them. Do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you from the love of God? I, I renounce them. them. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Savior? I do. Do you put your whole trust in his grace and love? I, I do. Do you promise to follow and obey him as your Lord? I do. And to all the people, will you who witness these vows do all in your power to support this child in her life in Christ? We you will. will. Let us join with she, all of us who are committing ourselves to Christ and renew our own baptismal covenant. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life and the life Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in the prayers? I will, with God's help. Will you persevere in resisting evil and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? I will, with God's help. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? I will, with God's help. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons? Take it away. Look. Baby moment. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's good. That's okay. Right. We knew that was gonna happen. Oh, <laughs> All right. All right. Ah. <laughs> We're at the top of page eleven. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? I will with God's help. And will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? I, I will, will with God's will. help. Let us now pray for little Harper Grace, who is to receive the sacrament of new birth. Deliver them, O Lord, from the way of sin and death. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. Open their hearts to your Tears grace and, and truth. Lord, hear our prayer. Fill their holy and life-giving spirit. Lord, hear our prayer. Keep them in the faith and communion of your holy church. Lord, hear our prayer. Teach them to love others in the power of the spirit. Lord, hear our prayer. Send them into the world and witness to your love. Lord, hear our prayer. Bring them to the fullness of your peace and glory. Lord, hear our prayer. Grant, O oh Lord, that all who are baptized into the death of Jesus Christ, your Son, may live in the power of his resurrection and look for him to come again in glory, who lives and reigns now and forever. Amen. Amen. <laughs> um, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. We thank you, Almighty God, for the gift of water. Over it, the Holy Spirit moved in the beginning of creation. Through it, you led the children of Israel out of their bondage. In Egypt into the land of promise. 
In it, your son received the baptism of John and was anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Messiah, the Christ, to lead us through his death and resurrection from the bondage of sin into everlasting life. We thank you, Father, for the water of baptism. In it, we are buried with Christ in his death. By it, we share in his resurrection. Through it, we are reborn by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in joyful obedience to your Son, we bring into his fellowship those who come, into, those who come to him in faith, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now sanctify this water, we pray you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that those who come here are cleansed from sin and born again, may forever continue into the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Savior. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. Okay. Okay, little Harper Grace. I don't know if like to put your hand in. And she can feel the water. Oh, it's nice and warm. Okay, here we go. Harper Grace, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And let the people say, Amen. 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 <laughs> Here's the hardest part is I don't get to hold her because of COVID. I know. Good job. It's okay. She wants to play. She's so playing. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that by water and the Holy Spirit you have bestowed upon this your servant the forgiveness of sin and have raised her to a new to the new life of grace. Sustain her, O oh Lord, in your Holy Spirit. Give her an inquiring, discerning heart, the courage to will and to persevere, a spirit to know and to love you, and a gift of joy and wonder in all your works. Amen. Amen. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked in Christ's own forever. Amen. Let us, let us welcome the newly baptized. We receive you into the household of God. Confess the faith of Christ. the faith of Christ. Proclaim the resurrection. Proclaim the resurrection and share with us in his eternal priesthood.
And may the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. With hearts brimming with joy, let us bring our hearts together as well for the birthday and anniversary prayer. And we do invite you to put in the comments any birthdays or anniversaries we can celebrate with you this week. Watch over thy servants, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise, Raise them up if they fall, and in their hearts may thy peace, which passeth understanding, abide all the days of their lives, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen, indeed. And as we come together for the offertory, again, my heartfelt thanks to you for your incredible generosity during this time. If you'd like to make a gift towards God's mission and ministry through St. Peter's, you're welcome to text to give at 858-252-0622. You can go to our parish website, stpetersdelmar.net slash give and make a one-time gift or set up an ongoing gift. You can also send a check to St. Peter's to our post office box 336, Delmar, California 92014. Walk in love as Christ loves us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. Oh.
all things come of thee, O Lord. And of thine own have we given thee. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And let us pray the prayer of St. Chrysostom together. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come life everlasting. Amen. And may Almighty God, who led the Magi by the shining of a star to find the Christ, the light from light, lead you also in your pilgrimage to find the Lord. Amen. May God, who sent the Holy Spirit to rest upon the only begotten at his baptism in the Jordan River, pour out that spirit on you who have come to the waters of new birth. Amen. May God, by the power that turned water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana, transform your lives and make glad your hearts. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen, indeed. Again, our heartfelt thanks, Dean Jefferson. Thank you so much for being with us. It is a delight to, um, to hear you preach the word again and to be able to share your experience of God's grace uh, through um, this medium and with my beloved parish. So thank you again so much. I look forward to a time perhaps well on the other side of this when we can have all of our guest preachers come to St. Peter's for something of a liturgical reunion, but I'll look forward to that very much. I hope you'll keep your calendar open. Uh, thank you to everyone who came to the annual meeting last Sunday. Uh, it was a wonderful annual meeting. Thank you uh, for engaging an annual meeting like none other we've ever experienced, uh, but I do appreciate all of you who came. We have um, posted the annual report and we have also recorded the annual meeting. So if you weren't able to be there, please email me and I will send you a link to the recording. Similarly, uh, for those who were not able to come to Sarah Jones's memorial service last Friday, uh, if you would like to um, watch the video of that memorial, you can email me as well at pblair at stpetersdelmar.net. And we have an announcement from our vestry as we had a vestry meeting on Tuesday night this week. My name is Alan Chapman, and I'm here to share the highlights of last Tuesday's vestry meeting. We started the meeting with an update on our Trinity expansion project from Peggy Martin. After unexpected excavation and rain deluge delays in January, we are getting back on track in February. We had comprehensive discussions led by the leadership of the task force for a safe return to campus, including the role vaccinations will play in our ability to return safely. In addition, Trigger's committee leader, Rick Uchoki, brought a proposal to change out one of these triggers and replace it with ICU capacity. Hopefully you saw the pie chart in your recent e-news. He shared this week's data, which includes a green piece of the pie. The numbers are starting to move in the right direction. And we are hopeful and looking forward to when we can return safely to campus for worship. We encourage you to get vaccinated when it is your turn and to continue to make safe choices. So these numbers continue to move in a healthy, safer direction. Treasurer Heather Maiden presented the 2020 financial results, as well as the numbers for January. And I'm happy to report your church is in a strong position. 
Thank you for your support through this diabolic year. If you haven't already, please consider a pledge for this year and contact Heather or pledge online. Thank you to everyone who attended the annual Paris meeting last Sunday. If you missed it and would like to watch the recording, please email Mother Page. As always, we ended with prayers of thanksgiving and supplication, particularly for our country in this time of great need. Thank you. It is an exciting weekend, and I hope that we will see all of you at our drive through Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock from 2 to 3. We are ready to send you home with all sorts of goodies to help you get ready for the days before Advent, or before Advent. That's what it feels like still, doesn't it? The days before Ash Wednesday, um, including a surprise, a Shrove Tuesday surprise for the first 50 of you to drive through. Uh, we will also have devotionals for uh, for Lent and Holy Week, and we have uh, also prepared for um, you to be able to participate with Reserve Sacrament. Uh, so please do drive through uh, and join us there. We also hope uh, that you will prayerfully consider a rule of life for the 40 days of Lent. And in your bulletin, you'll see um, an outline for a rule of life. Also, we will link to it in the eblast but it's a way to really shape the time of Lent and set it aside as a very special and prayerful season. And so um, I know that our preacher for the first Sunday of Lent will be uh, most likely discussing this, um, but encourage you to think about how um, the spiritual disciplines of worship, penitence, self-examination and confession, personal devotion, fasting and giving can be part of your journey. So worship, penitence, devotion, fasting, and giving. And prayerfully consider this in the days before Ash Wednesday so that you have the opportunity for a truly rich and holy time during this journey that will be Lent and is upon us just faster than I can get my head around it. So I'm calling it Advent, you know that it has taken me by surprise as well as everyone else. Also, excited about our Lenten Forum. We will be spending Lent on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. with Mark the Evangelist. We will take the uh, journey through Mark's gospel uh, with some real intentionality and have a chance to experience it as a whole uh, as Mark intended it. We hear bits and pieces, uh, selections in the lectionary on Sunday mornings, but to really have a chance to live into the story and the drama of this incredible story um, is a real privilege. So we'll do that together. Your homework, should you choose to accept it, is to pick up your favorite Bible and or maybe a new translation and read the gospel according to Mark. It's only 16 chapters. You actually can do it in an afternoon. Um, make yourself comfortable, put your feet up and really dive into this story. And we will begin discussing this gospel next Sunday at 10 a.m. and I can't wait to share that journey with all of you. Are there other announcements I should be making friends at this time that I am forgetting? No. Okay, well, then let us sing this last hymn before Lent <laughs> with all the alleluias, ye watchers and ye holy ones. Oh. 
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.